up, everybody. It's time. Please welcome. Introducing. Making sense. Are you ready for it? Of a changing world. Wow. Okay, okay. 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 Anthropologists. think getting a car phone is not for them, whatever the reason, haven't kept up with the booming industry of cellular radio telephone. Yeah, the booming industry. I wonder what's going to happen. Revolution in communications could make it possible for more and more people to have a phone in their car. A phone in their car? And one that travels with you. And that travels like with you. A unique cellular portable made by Motorola, which weighs only 30 What hours. will they think of next? Right now, time on an electronic watch. Figuring on an electronic calculator. Wow, it's almost as if someday one device will replace all these things. Industry watchers say <clears throat> there are only a few thousand cellular phones in use right now. But that number is yeah, probably more people will get them. Within the next few years, during the cellular I mean, it is after all the cellular revolution. With the new Nokia 7110 in your hand, you have the world at your fingertips. Turn and click to write a message. Use the Navi Roller to select from Holy up to shit, it's got a Navi numbers, Roller! Each with up to five numbers and two rows of text. Five numbers per person. That was actually useful because everybody had five phone numbers back then. Um, landline, cell phone, pager, office, fax machine. Um, okay, well, it connects to the World Wide Web. That's interesting. So you can look at the internet, check plane tickets. 1999, what a time to be alive. Yep, no more searching for needles and haystacks. Now we got the Nokia 7110. Why search when you can find? <laughs> Nobody ever used phones for this in those days. This is false advertising. Stock prices or news about your company. So all of that was just to try to illustrate one example of cultural change as a result of globalization. Some old cell phone commercials. Um... There were cell phones, of course, going back to the 80s, as you saw in that first clip. But the 80s cell phones cost literally thousands of dollars. Uh, they were the size of a brick. And I think they were seen by most people as this kind of ridiculous status symbol that would probably never really catch on. Um, they were like an even more decadent version of the car phone, which, as the name suggests, was like a landline that people kept in their cars. Uh, it even had like a spiral cord, like, a, like really old corded landline phones did. Um, so by about the late 1990s, fast forwarding a bit, cell phones were pretty commonplace, but most of them could just make phone calls and nothing else. Uh, some of them, like the one you saw in that second commercial, had some kind of limited internet capability, but it was the, the, the way they accessed the internet was very slow. It was very expensive and as a result, not very useful. So a phone with the internet kind of became like the new status symbol. It was cool just to have and be able to say you had it, even though everybody knew it was actually pretty close to useless. Um, that's the late 90s. At some point, roughly 10 years ago, I guess, it became normal for almost everyone to have a smartphone with them at all times and to have their face buried in it at almost all times. Basically, this, this portable device that's as powerful as a pretty good desktop computer used to be, um, this constant you know access point to pretty much any piece of information or entertainment that exists in digital form at all times. So walking the streets with your face buried in your phone became normal. And when tablets first came out, people used to do that with tablets. So you know walking around with both hands holding a tablet, looking at the tablet, walking around, walking into people, walking into uh, lampposts, etc. So I think after enough pedestrian collisions, people started to shame others for walking while texting, or wexting, as it was briefly called. Uh, but, you know, everybody still does it. Um, also, I haven't even mentioned uh, or highlighted the fact that in that 80s commercial, there was one scene where the guy was dialing a number while driving. So face, you know clearly focused on the phone while driving dialing a number um and this was completely legal in most if not all jurisdictions up until a few years ago i forget exactly when but relatively recently um in the history of this cellular revolution as that commercial called it um all right so what's the point look there, there was no one moment there was no day in 2010 or 2011 when people woke up and realized that Everyone has a smartphone now, and with that, our culture has now changed completely. There was never any one moment where that became apparent. But looking back, you can probably think of examples of how, of how very different life was 
before voice recognition, before GPS, before FaceTime or whatever. Um, so academics have been talking about space-time compression for years. The idea that technology has changed how we experience time and distance. Because with every new invention, humans can communicate faster and faster and with people further and further away. So it's as if, in communications anyway, time is speeding up and it's like the distance between places is, is shrinking. So people said this about airplanes when they were new. Um, they said this about the internet, of course, in the 90s. But I think we've only recently started to study the cultural effects of smartphones and how ubiquitous they are. And now, of course, we have the, the global shutdown of face-to-face -face communication as a result of COVID-19 to add to this list of things to study. Um, which to me, I think is, it looks to me like the last straw, if you want to call it that, in terms of this kind of technology becoming the new default norm in like all aspects of life. So we have some apps for talking to friends, others for, for work, others for school. Um, and for now, anyway, it looks like everything is being done through screens. This is the new normal way to do everything. Um, a lot of people are watching this video right now, of course, on, on screens, pro probably on phones or tablets as part of a university course. And for the moment, that's the current normal. Um, but everything I just said is probably going to look as quaint or hilarious as the 80s or the 90s commercial. If anyone watches this video, I have no idea what the future of this YouTube channel is or YouTube itself is. But if someone's watching this in 10 or 15 years, it's going to look funny. This video being shot on, a, on an iPad in an amateur kitchen studio. Um, and I'm holding this you know, somewhat newish iPhone that's kind of new now, but in 10 or 15 years will probably look as funny as that brick-shaped 80s phone because culture changes slowly and gradually, and you only really notice it when looking back over a period of a decade or so. Videos about cultural change, uh, or more specifically, globalization. I'll talk about what globalization is, whether it is something new or something that's been happening for centuries or even longer. Um, I'll talk about globalization and cultural homogenization, or the idea that the world is gradually developing into, you know, one global consumer culture that's, that's dominated by Western corporations, remaking the world in a Western image. Uh, that's one way of looking at things. I'll talk about that. I'll also talk about globalization and cosmopolitanism, which I think is a less depressing way of looking at things. Uh, that idea says what's really happening is faraway places are influencing each other like never before, and the results of that are unpredictable and, and complicated. It's not quite as simple as cultural homogenization. So I'll talk about that, and I'll wrap up with a few words about some of the uglier sides of globalization, like the rise of racist and xenophobic sentiment around the world in recent years, and then I'll do my best to conclude on something of a positive note. Here's a list of this week's keywords. We have globalization, cultural change, deterritorialization, and cultural imperialism. So what is globalization? Uh, well, at one level, it's a very overused catchphrase. Uh, it's been overused for, I don't know, 20, 25 years. It's come to mean everything and nothing all at once, all at the same time. But I think it's still a useful concept in anthropology. So I'll speak for a bit about what anthropologists mean by globalization. Um, well, it's actually going to be more than a bit. It's probably going to take me an, an hour or something. So I appreciate your patience. I'll try to make it interesting. Um, all right, what is globalization according to anthropologists? Here's one definition from 1995, which I know isn't exactly current, but I think most of this still works pretty well. We can think of it as social, economic, cultural, and demographic processes that take place within nations, but also transcend them. So to break this down a bit, it's a set of processes it happens within specific countries, but those processes are also somehow bigger than any one country. And so the definition continues, uh, attention limited to local processes, identities, and units of analysis yields incomplete understanding of the local. So like I said, that definition is a little bit old, you know, it's only 25 years old, uh, but I think a lot of it still works and I like it because it doesn't just define globalization. It also tells us how to study places in light of globalization. And it makes the point that it's not enough to just describe how things are locally. We need to also be looking out for global connections because those global connections are always there somewhere. Um, if that doesn't make sense yet, it should by the, the end of the episode. Let's look some more at the anthropology of globalization. 
Meanwhile, here's another definition. If that first one didn't quite make sense, this one might also help. Uh, we can also think of globalization as the intensification of worldwide social relations that link distant localities in such a way that local happenings are shaped by events occurring many miles away and vice versa. Well, let's just convert that to kilometers because it's a Canadian video, many kilometers away and vice versa. All right, so the first definition talked about social, cultural, demographic, economic changes. Um, in this episode, I'll talk about the social and the cultural ones, a little bit about demographics, and next episode is all about the economic changes. And one idea that runs through both these definitions is that these processes take place within nations, but also transcend them. Now, here's one example of a local development that only really makes sense in global context. Uh, one thing happening in Canada over the past 30 or so years has been a shift to a precarious labor market. So the old situation was you used to be able to finish high school or not and then get a decent paying job doing the exact same thing every day for 45 years and along the way it would be enough to pay the bills. You would have a strong union to back you up all the way through um, and many of these working class jobs also allowed people to access and take for granted a standard of living that we now associate with the middle class in some sense. Uh, enough money not just to get by but also to buy a, a big car and a small house in places like Hamilton or Oshawa or Scarborough, also enough to you know go to the Caribbean for a week once a year, say for the future. Um, it wasn't paradise, but in global terms and by today's standards, it was a pretty good deal for the working class. And this was sort of taken for granted by many blue-collar Canadians up until about the 80s, I would say. But in recent years, more and more jobs are minimum wage, and of course you can't survive on a minimum wage job alone. Uh, even jobs that pay well tend to be short-term contracts, and unionization rates are quite low at the moment. Um, a couple of years ago, for example, GM, General Motors, announced it was closing its operations in Oshawa. So 2,500 people would directly lose their jobs, to say nothing of the kind of spillover effect that happens in towns where you know massive industrial operations shut down. Uh, the company later announced that it would, it would instead use the plant for a smaller part of the manufacturing process and thus keep 300 of those jobs. But still, that adds up to a lot of jobs lost all at once, about 2,200. Uh, so that, that was a, a shocking announcement when it came. But what it really is is the kind of end point of a long process of downsizing that's been happening since the 1980s when the plant employed over 20,000 people at its peak. Um, it's also an indication of a broader trend that is outlined in this article that I have on the screen, which makes the point that fewer than half of Canadians aged 25 to 54 now have full-time year-round jobs, something most people took for granted, granted in the past is now almost uh, seen as like a luxury that more than half of us of you know roughly working age, 25 to 54, do not have. Um, I also heard a recent estimate that about 2 million Canadians now work in what's called the gig economy. So, so you know, ways of making a living based on short-term kind of microtransactions with no stability, no promise for the future, and uh, relatively low pay as overall. So fewer than half of Canadians, age 25 to 54, now have full-time year-round jobs, and you're looking at one of them. I'm contract faculty, which means I don't have a full-time year-round job. I get paid on a course-by-course -course basis by various universities across the greater Toronto area. Um, sometimes I have lots of work, sometimes I have a bit less. I'm fortunate, and then it usually averages out to something like a full-time job. And I feel that I'm even more fortunate because my job involves talking about and making videos about things that I'm interested in, stuff I would write and, you know, make videos about and think about anyway if I wasn't get paid to do so, getting paid to do so. So I'm very privileged in this way, but it's still not an ideal labor situation. And it's the reality for more and more Canadians every year, no matter how hard you work or no matter how many degrees you have. So precarious labor in Canada is a result of processes that are specific to Canada, um, there were decisions that were made by politicians and by business leaders in Canada that made this happen. So it's a process that took place within this nation. But the process also transcends the nation. It's bigger than Canada because the same thing is happening in many other nations. And some of the key decisions that made these, this process happen were made at international levels. But that's more relevant to uh, next episode's content on economic and political globalization. Today we're talking more about the, the cultural effects of globalization, so I'll get back on topic.
Next keyword is cultural change. Um, it's a pretty simple idea. It's, it doesn't exactly take my A game to explain this one. Uh, people have cultures, and cultures change. So, big deal. Why are we talking about this? Well, globalization is one of the things that makes cultures change. Um, I don't really have a clear definition of this for you, but I have three points about cultural change that I would like you to keep in mind through the examples we're about to look at. First point is ch cultural change usually occurs gradually, uh, the second point is it's usually only recognizable in retrospect. So when looking back over a period of a, a decade or two or more. Um, third point is that we can't confuse cultural change with progress. So like I said, with those uh, looking at those old cell phone commercials, it's, it's very rare that people wake up one morning and find that their culture is now today very different from what it was yesterday. You normally only notice cultural change looking back over a, a, you know, a longer term period. And um, even though at the time the changes are slow and gradual and barely perceptible, when you take that look back over a few years at a time, the results can be pretty jarring and uh, in some cases kind of funny, like those commercials from 20 years ago that looked uh, you know, revolutionary in their time and are now hilariously outdated. So on that third point, not confusing cultural change with progress, uh, I've been saying this since episode one and I want to keep emphasizing it through the rest of the series, there's a widespread assumption that neoliberal capitalism in its globalized form is the greatest thing that humans have ever come up with and that the closer a country or a group of people get to that neoliberal capitalist model, the more advanced they are. Um, but as I've been saying all throughout the series, and I'll keep saying it, that that is a culturally biased assumption. And in that specific form that I just sort of summarized, it's not even that old of an idea. It's That idea is, in, in that form, is not even 50 years old. Uh, and, and this logic of constant growth and constant expansion is not exactly compatible with the reality of, uh, you know, for example, this small thing that we call climate change, which experts on climate change have been trying to tell us since the early 1970s. The next key word from this episode is cultural imperialism, which we can define as the imposition of a powerful country's culture on another country or group of people. This certainly seems to be the case in, in many examples of cultural change, but as a whole, it, 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 many say that it's too simple of a way of categorizing cultural change during globalization as a whole, but we'll get into that a bit later on. For now, back to the, the big picture idea of globalization. And one of the first debates or issues that often come up when people talk about globalization is whether or not it's something new or something even worth calling globalization. So on that note, um, Stories of Culture and Place by Kenny and Smilly, that textbook has a section called Culture and Place, A New Relationship. And I want to share a couple of quotes from that chapter um, to begin. Kenny and Smilly write, cultural change is occurring at breakneck speed all over the world. The ability to communicate across vast geographical spaces in a manner that makes time nearly irrelevant has greatly changed the way in which many people live their lives. The internet and other technological developments have introduced a new dimension to the concept of diffusion, and this is what's called space-time compression, and I think we saw that hinted at through those old cell phone commercials that I started this episode with. Another point that often comes up in the is globalization old or new debate is uh, the issue of migration, which is certainly nothing new. So, for example, small-scale societies relocate regularly. Um, European colonialism in the Americas began hundreds of years ago, as we've been talking about throughout the series, and there are many other examples of colonialism or things like it that go back much further. But what is new about migration is how much of it there is, and also the, ki the kinds of conditions that are placed on that mobility. Um, and the same textbook I've been mentioning, Stories of Culture in Place by Kenny and Smilly, uh, gives some interesting numbers that illustrate what I said about border crossings a couple of episodes ago and that I think is useful to revisit at, at this point in this episode. And these numbers include uh, nearly nine-tenths of people in the world live in their country of birth and 70% of international migrants. So of those people who do move from country to country, 70% come from the global south. And of them, roughly half migrate to other economically developing countries, as, as they're called. So what these numbers illustrate, I think, is that it's crucial to note that there is a lot of mobility happening, but there are still huge restrictions placed on that mobility. So the ability to go where you want to go, or even to go where you need to go, is limited to a rather small and privileged proportion of humanity. 
We'll talk more about that harsh reality next episode, though. For now, I want to continue with the, the cultural effects of globalization. And to illustrate that, here is an image of a bunch of people doing Tai Chi together at Toronto's City Hall, uh, you know, out, out in front of it. Um, it's an example, I think, of how culture and place are not as closely tied together as they used to be, which is sounds like a bit of a dense idea, but I think it's something that we have all experienced and understand, you know, in, in some way. It's just a way of adding a bit more analysis to that, to that observation. Anyway, culture and place are not as closely tied together as they used to be. So now that we have all this new media, we can share information without physical travel like never before. And so to quote Kenny and Smelly again, we get examples of cultural globalization like, for example, teenagers in China are infatuated with pop stars from Taiwan and Hong Kong. Uh, kids in the Philippines watch Disney cartoons in their living rooms. Or, as you see on the, on the screen now, the elderly in Canada practice Tai Chi in community centers, or in this case, in front of Toronto City Hall. Uh, just examples kind of taken at random of some of the many, many forms of cultural globalization in which local culture is not as closely tied to local place as it used to be. So let's add some more theory to this, uh, which might seem to make things even more vague, but it, it actually helps clarify things, I think. Let's, let's give it a chance. Um, I'm going to start with these twin concepts, deterritorialization and territoriality. Uh, what these very needlessly long words refer to is uh, what I just said about that relationship between culture and place during globalization. Before globalization, culture was more closely tied to place. So typically a local grouping of people like a country or an ethnic group, for example, would uh, arguably have its own culture and that culture mostly stayed with them in that place where they lived. And people didn't move around as much, so there was less of a chance for people to bring their culture to other places and then come back home with the influences of other cultures. Uh, so globalization has weakened that, that formerly very close relationship between culture and place. So in those examples we just went through, um, starting with Canadian seniors doing Tai Chi, that is a Chinese cultural practice that I think arguably has now become part of Canadian culture to at least some extent. I, I think, you know, almost if not every community center in Canadian cities probably has a Tai Chi program. So is Tai Chi now a part of Canadian culture? Well, it came from somewhere else. It's here. It's ubiquitous now. Um, anyway, there are infinite examples like that. And if you add up these effects, it means that culture is being deterritorialized. So you don't have, you know, Chinese culture and Canadian culture existing in these, these completely separate boxes. Like all other cultures, globalization is, in one sense, pulling them away from their place of origin and blending them into some sort of global culture. And yet, at the same time, there's also territoriality, which I think this short quote explains quite clearly. Uh, what do we mean by territoriality? Well, despite the weakening of cultural ties to place, or the deterritorialization of culture, which I just covered in, in, in the last uh, last segment, last visuals. Um, despite that, there will always there will always exist an element of place or territoriality within culture because people live and operate in local environments, and it is in these locations that culture moves, changes, and is experienced. So what these last two concepts boil down to is culture is globalized, and it's not as closely linked to specific places as it used to be, but place still matters. So to continue with the Tai Chi example, without knowing as much as I'd like to about Tai Chi, and um, I mean, I guess I could have researched this some more before making this video, but I only have so much time. Like I said, I'm, I'm contract faculty. I have to get this done so I can go on to the next gig. <laughs> um, anyway, the point is, w without knowing you know everything about Tai Chi, I'm, I'm, I'm going to assume that the way that it's practiced in Toronto is probably not exactly the same way it's practiced the world over because almost every time you see people take on a cultural practice that comes from another place, they usually do so in a way that involves their own kind of local spin on it. Or to continue with uh, a couple of the other examples that, that I mentioned briefly, um, in places that didn't used to have American movies, the second that somebody watches an American movie for the first time or puts on a pair of Nike shoes for the first time, it doesn't mean they you know lose their old culture and it's suddenly been replaced with like American pop culture. Um, it's not that simple. The local and the global matter and kind of coexist at the same time. And sometimes it becomes hard to tell where the local stops and the global starts, which might be a bit confusing, but I hope it makes sense by the end of the episode. 
so Hollywood movies, uh, American fast food chains, running shoes made by huge corporations, maybe those are examples of cultural imperialism or the imposition of a powerful country's culture on another country or a group of people. And many of the things we describe as globalization do indeed look this way, like cultural imperialism. So in an economic sense, which I'll discuss more next episode, Corporations run by billionaires from wealthy countries have a lot of control over the economies of poor countries. And culturally, there are many examples of, of local music, local art being influenced by American and European pop culture. And there are many examples of people in, in non-Western societies who start to see themselves and the world around them through a Western lens. And in fact, the entire field of post-colonial studies, uh, a lot of the work in that vein is, is, is dedicated to, to that question. What does that look like? Um, sometimes this means that local customs and practices disappear. And for many people, that's a devastating loss. But it's not inevitable, and it doesn't always happen that way. And a good example of this is what happened when McDonald's tried to set up shop in, in Bolivia. So apparently hamburgers are quite popular in Bolivia and they've long been that way long before McDonald's showed up trying to sell hamburgers in Bolivia. McDonald's never really caught on in Bolivia and there's a link to a video in the description that I think does a good job of explaining why. But if you don't watch it, I'll summarize it for now anyway. Uh, McDonald's, of course, is one of the world's most popular restaurants. Didn't catch on in Bolivia, though. It seems that rather than going to McDonald's, most people there would rather eat burgers made the local way and buy them from informal vendors in the street. Uh, the issue of cultural difference is very important to this story. But people also had a problem with McDonald's on political grounds. And as an example of that, uh, the image on this slide is a group of young people in Latin America holding an anti-McDonald's protest. Um, so if you speak Spanish, you already know what the banner says. But for those who don't, here's a translation. It basically says, Mick shit, another imperialist trap to increase poverty. So in the end, McDonald's only had eight restaurants in Bolivia until the last one closed in 2002. But they've since tried again. Uh, in 2015, a new McDonald's franchise opened up in Santa Cruz, uh, Bolivia's biggest city. And I haven't been able to find any updates on how they're doing. But regardless, I think the fact that they failed in the past when they succeeded almost everywhere else is a good example of how cultural imperialism is maybe not inevitable. So here are some other examples of cultural change that many would describe as cultural homogenization, or in other words, the whole world becoming westernized or Americanized or Europeanized, as the place may be, and thus kind of all the same. Uh, this is the IKEA in Santo Domingo, the capital city of the Dominican Republic. Um, I lived in Santo Domingo for a year once, and at that point, the IKEA had just opened, and many people were quite excited about it. So, you know, for my part, I was renting a furnished apartment in the like, close to the downtown of that city, and everything in that apartment, in that furnished apartment, was furnished with IKEA furniture. So basically, I was in the Dominican Republic, but living on the same kind of low-cost plywood furniture that I would have been in student accommodations anywhere in Canada, for that matter. Here are two teenage girls outside a Justin Bieber concert in China a few years ago, uh, you know, by the looks of this photo, dressing, acting, consuming in much the same way that Canadian teenagers were at the same time. And this is an ad for Marlboro cigarettes in Indonesia. Uh, tobacco companies still advertise in many parts of the world with impunity. And, and this is an example of the Marlboro brand taking full advantage of the ability to do so in Indonesia. So arguably, those are all examples of cultural homogenization, three completely different places where people consume Western products, and as a result, their local cultures become more similar to the West and more similar to each other at the same time. And depending on how you feel about that politically, you might also call that cultural imperialism. But at the same time, there's something else happening called cosmopolitanism, or a global outlook emerging in response to increased globalization. I mentioned this at the end of the last episode um, when I was talking about Canadian multiculturalism and, and my point was I think that the, the way that that's practiced in everyday life by ordinary people, the way people kind of live out multiculturalism in their daily lives, it looks something like, like this, like cosmopolitanism. It's a global outlook emerging in response to increased globalization. And you can contrast this with the kind of limited local outlook that most people all over the world had um, at all other points in, in history. And 
like I said a few minutes ago, before globalization, culture tended to stay in one place more. But now cultures move all over the world, often unpredictably. It seems that every nation in the world is influenced to at least some extent by every other nation. And I'll show you some, some examples of that in the, in the minutes to come. Even though we don't understand, we enjoy the music, music videos, dances. Yeah, it's pretty fun. They have a CD for each band member. This store's owner says K-pop's appeal crosses language and cultural barriers. It crosses language and cultural barriers. It's almost like an anthropologist wrote this. And it's good dance music. The fan base for K-pop has been growing in this city making Toronto a more attractive stop for South Korean boy and girl bands venturing outside of Asia. A concert last fall for a band called Big Bang drew 12,000 fans to the Air Canada Centre. So it took me until uh, a couple years ago to learn what K-pop is, and it took me a while to understand the concept. I think what was hard for me to understand is the way that um, North America could be such a huge market for music in a language that most North Americans don't speak. So going back to at least the 50s, the days of Elvis, when television was new, um, English language pop music has been popular with audiences all over the world who don't necessarily speak any English. And that's, of course, really accelerated since the 80s with uh, music videos and much more so since the 90s with the Internet. But to my knowledge, it's only really been in this recent moment in the internet age that it's been happening in reverse, which with, with things like Korean language pop music becoming very popular in a place like, like Toronto. So what's the point? Why am I talking about K-pop in this very serious academic video? I mean, what is K-pop? It's just teenagers and young adults singing love songs in the Korean language and people in other countries enjoying the sounds and the dance moves and the fashion. I mean, that, that's all that's going on, right? Turns out that's wrong. It turns out K-pop is a serious political force at present. So amidst the wave of uprisings that emerged in response to the killing of George Floyd by Minneapolis police officers, some of the biggest stars in K-pop have announced that they've, they've donated to Black Lives Matter and to other groups protesting against anti-black racism. And perhaps more interestingly, K-pop fans, or, or stands as the slang goes, uh, have launched their own massive intervention into the online discussions of George Floyd's death and the Black Lives Matter movement. So what they've done is focused on a series of, of anti-black and otherwise racist hashtags that were being used to disparage the protesters. And the K-pop fans have sabotaged those racist hashtags by flooding them with pictures of K-pop stars. So now, if somebody looks up a, a racist hashtag, instead of seeing something like an, an offensive meme or, or a piece of fake news about Black Lives Matter or something, as was intended, uh, someone searching that hashtag will instead get this torrent of pictures of, of K-pop stars, of BTS or Blackpink or whoever. So... Pretty interesting, pretty creative. Not something I think many expected to come out of the K-pop fan culture, but as it turns out, um, it's a very politically involved uh, fandom. Another example of the kind of creative and maybe unpredictable aspects of globalization is what are called global subcultures. So well, I'll say some more about this in the urban anthropology episode coming up in a little while, but a subculture is basically a group of people who share common interests that somehow distinguish them from the broader culture they're a part of. Uh, there's a lot of anthropology on this topic, a lot of sociology, and a lot of debate on whether it's a useful concept or not. Um, we don't need to get into all that for now. For now, the point is just that before mass communication, especially the internet, subculture also used to stay in one place. But now subcultures are also global. So here's an example of one subculture, the subculture around hardcore music and this image is a hardcore band in Seoul, South Korea. So if you're not familiar, uh, hardcore is a specific variety, I guess, of punk rock music. Um, it's very heavy, it's played very loud, the vocals are usually screamed, and the lyrics are often about frustration with the way things are in the world and the need for some kind of, of revolution. Um, it's the kind of music that started in the United States in the early 1980s, and now it exists worldwide including in Seoul, South Korea. So there's a link to a documentary in the description that includes a brief segment on the hardcore scene in Seoul, South Korea. It's always crazy here. Yeah. So that's why we picked this venue. It's gonna be crazy. Yeah. 
굉장히 많아요. 대한민국에도 정말 멋진 한국 밴드들이 많아서 그 사람들이랑 이렇게 같이 함께 할수 있다는 건 저희한테 영광인 것 같습니다. 포기하지 않기를 다들. So what this involves is a, a largely unknown style of music emerged in New York City in the early 80s and 35 or so years later it has a fan base also in Seoul just like in many other cities worldwide um, and, and not just cities for that matter uh, the point is the New York of the 80s and the Seoul of the 2010s are two very different contexts but as you'll see in, in that video that I linked to it was made in 2015 or 2016 um, as some of the fans of this music in Korea described it something about it resonated with that small group of youth in Seoul South Korea um, almost as if the music was about their own experiences so there's lots more I could say about this uh, it's my favorite kind of music so I mean I can make a whole video series about it that's what I'd like to do with this series so maybe when I'm a, a tenured professor I could get away with doing that but anyway the point is, it's, it's an example of a global subculture. Uh, before globalization and before the internet in particular, it seems unlikely that any of this would have happened. Um, with, you know, obscure kinds of music having truly global audiences like this. But now I'm sure you could pick any, any weird, obscure kind of music from one place and then pick any other country anywhere in the world at random. And there are probably at least a few people in that country that, that like that, that kind of music. And one example of something similar that I'll mention just quickly, um, death metal. So the image on this screen is a picture of some death metal fans in Botswana. Uh, death metal is arguably one of the most extreme and to many people offensive genres of music uh, possibly ever. Um, drums and guitars are usually very fast. The vocals are this kind of guttural roar and the lyrics are often this, this kind of very graphic depiction of, of things like murder or uh, you know zombie rampages. Um, anyway, for these and other reasons, you don't really hear death metal on the radio or at the mall, um, and a number of death metal records have been banned in various countries worldwide. But somehow, death metal found a fan base in Botswana, a, a majority Christian country in southern Africa. So just to be abundantly clear, the vast majority of people in Botswana do not listen to death metal, of course, just like the vast majority of Canadians or Americans don't. But the fact that even a few people... In, in, in Botswana, in the United States, in Canada, anywhere. The fact that any, any number of people in any place listen to this is to me an example of a global subculture that's been made possible largely by the internet. And these things just didn't really exist before that. So just to start putting the pieces together, here's a map of global flows that I'll keep adding to throughout the rest of the episode. These arrows represent cultural products moving from one place on the map to another. I'll keep adding to them as we go. So far we have K-pop going from Seoul to Toronto, death metal going from Florida to Botswana, and hardcore going from New York City to Seoul. Now here's a couple more examples that bring us back to the idea of cultural imperialism and I think help us complicate that idea. So just to review, cultural imperialism refers to the, the culture of a powerful country somehow influencing or harming the cultures of less powerful countries. So in today's world, that usually means cultural products coming from the West, uh, largely the United States and Western Europe, and being consumed in, in other places worldwide in ways that kind of diminish or, or harm local cultures. But there are many examples of globalization happening that have nothing to do with the United States or Western Europe. And in these examples, places outside the West are sharing with each other in ways that don't even involve the West. One example is the fact that Bollywood has an audience in Nigeria. So movies and music made in Mumbai, India, mostly in the Hindi language, being enjoyed by people in Nigeria who don't speak Hindi. Uh, Nigeria is a former British colony in West Africa, for those who don't know. And there's an image uh, illustrating this on the left. It's a cassette tape entitled Bollywood Influenced Film Music from Nigeria. And the image on the right, that's from a website about sushi restaurants in Sao Paulo, Brazil. Uh, it's, it's 10 Japanese restaurants with hodizio, which basically means all-you-can-eat buffet. Uh, since the early 1900s, there has been a lot of Japanese immigration to Brazil, especially to certain areas like Sao Paulo. So over the generations, some Japanese Brazilians have moved back and forth between the two countries, usually for economic reasons. And there's a link to a video in the description on that experience from about a decade ago. So the results of all of that movement 
over that time is this kind of transnational hybridized culture arguably that exists in both places and also between both places at the same time so to wrap up this point you could say that people in nigeria listening to bollywood music um and, and, and the kind of fusion of Brazilian and Japanese culture that you see on the other side of the, the same slide, the same image. Um, these are two more examples, I think, of cosmopolitanism. And remember, like I said a bit earlier, about half of the international migrants who leave a country in the global south go to another country in the global south. So just think about all that cultural sharing and mixing that comes with that, and you get countless more examples of this kind of cosmopolitanism. And now I've added those last two examples to the map. So we have Bollywood from Mumbai going to Lagos and Sushi from Tokyo going to Sao Paulo. Another important aspect of cosmopolitanism is that the idea of cultural imperialism doesn't really account for how the West is also changing as a result of globalization. So here we are in Canada, we export Justin Bieber and Drake and Celine Dion to the world and you know our, our mining companies operate all over Latin America, often causing major environmental damage and social unrest in the process. But our culture here is also changing through globalization and becoming more cosmopolitanism. So one example is Tai Chi, which I've already discussed. Uh, another is arguably the popularity of yoga. And I'm sure we can think of many more examples of how the local culture of a place like Toronto is changing as a result of globalization. Now, it's important to look at the power imbalance here, because in a wealthy country like Canada, many of us get to pick and choose what cultural products we, we want to consume and be influenced by. Whereas in other parts of the world, people don't often have that same freedom of choice. Which gets us to questions of cultural appropriation. Um, and I'll say more about that near the end of the series in the visual anthropology episode. You know, what, what is cultural exchange? What is cultural borrowing? At what point do these things become theft? Um, it's complicated. We'll talk about it in the visual anthropology episode. In the meantime, the point is that the West is also becoming more cosmopolitan as a result of globalization. And that gives us two more cultural flows to add to our map. So we have Tai Chi from China and Yoga from India, both coming to Canada. Now here's the point of those amateur map uh, PowerPoint graphics. I only have so much time to draw arrows, but I could have drawn thousands of arrows like that because cosmopolitanism means that every country in the world has at least some connection to every other country in the world. So picture this map covered with thousands of arrows like these, and that's what cosmopolitanism looks like. This limitless exchange of ideas, of products, of art, of, of lifestyles all over the world, often between places very far away from each other that had little to no connection to each other until relatively recently. So that was cosmopolitanism. It's, it's a nice idea. And I think in this day and age, it's important to highlight examples of globalization that show how humans can be pretty decent, how humans can be creative and open-minded. We, we all need more of that. But we also have to talk more about the less pleasant aspects of globalization. And many of these are related to the economic side of globalization. For example, this is the Rana Plaza disaster in Savar, Bangladesh in 2013. 1,100 people died when this building collapsed after a fire. Uh, the building was owned by a local business person who rented the space to two clothing companies, so it, it was a sweatshop, basically. And next episode, I'll talk about how a similar labor arrangement plays out in many other countries worldwide when I focus on neoliberalism and economic globalization. But for now, I need to talk about some cultural responses to globalization that are, in many ways, quite alarming. Um, while the world is getting more interconnected and while people are sharing art and culture and technology like never before, there's also a lot of resistance to the things that we think of as cosmopolitanism. And that resistance includes some rather frightening displays of hatred and violence. So on that note, I'll provide a content warning. I'm going to have to talk in the next couple of minutes uh, about some examples of racist violence. The situation is, in many places around the world, we're seeing the rise of what anthropologists and other academics call ethno-nationalism, which, as the name suggests, it's, it's a strong belief in ethnicity and nation at the same time. So, like I said in the episode about nationalism, 
every nation state is multicultural to at least some extent. Um, and we talked about some examples of nation states that include many different ethnicities, and usually some of those ethnic communities enjoy more power and privilege than others. Now, ethno-nationalism is the belief that the borders of a nation state should very closely overlap with, with the imagined borders of an ethnic community and that the ethnic community should have total control over its own political and economic affairs. Now, this almost always or always entails at least some hostility to other ethnicities, especially minorities. But this is almost always downplayed or denied by ethno-nationalist movements. They usually claim to be, you know, not racist, but just patriotic, for example. This is an image of some white supremacists marching in Charlottesville, Virginia in 2017. That night they marched with lawn torches chanting blood and soil, which is a slogan the Nazis had used to express their idea that Germany should be for Germans only. Neo-Nazis are among the most extreme examples of these ethno-nationalist movements. And that image is from the, the quote, Unite the Right rally which happened, as I said, in Charlottesville, Virginia in 2017. Uh, the situation was there was a plan to remove a statue, a statue of Robert E. Lee, who was a commander in the Confederate Army. Um, a wide variety of extremist and racist groups showed up to oppose the removal of the statue. Meanwhile, anti-racist protesters showed up to oppose the racist rally, and during the clashes, uh, Heather Heyer was killed, and 19 more people were injured when someone drove a car into the anti-racist protesters. Um, it's been said the driver had been, you know, fascinated with the Nazis and white supremacist ideas, since since high school um at first president trump refused to take sides and said that there were very fine people on both sides of that violence he later denounced the racists and said that he opposes racism and hatred in the strongest possible terms and then later on again repeated that there was violence on on many sides so that was the United States in 2017. Here are some other examples. In November 2017, 60,000 people took part in a march in Warsaw, Poland, and the march had been called to celebrate Poland's national independence, but it was organized by far-right groups, and it included white supremacist slogans and people voicing hatred of, of Jews and Muslims. Meanwhile, in England... Uh, Brexit is a very complicated issue that we don't have time to get into fully, but the point for now is that some of those who supported it were motivated by a sense of ethno-nationalism. There's been an increase in violence and, and hatred against minority ethnic groups in the UK, including the Polish. So I've included an image from an article about anti-Polish sentiment in England. Um, there's also been a serious problem all over Europe with violence against the Roma ethnic minority. And I have here an image from a, a town in Hungary where a militia with connections to a legitimized political party has been terrorizing Roma communities with the goal of forcing them out of Hungary. Also on this, on this screen, here in Canada, there was a, a resurgence of, of racist and anti-immigration organizing in the past couple of years. Uh, for a while, there was a rally at Toronto City Hall about once a month. Um, organizers usually say these rallies are for some other purpose. Usually it's said they're, they're about free speech or there's some kind of protest against the Trudeau government. But if you read their social media postings and some of the signs that uh, they carry at these rallies, it becomes quite clear that they're motivated by, by hatred of particular ethnic minorities, even while their membership includes members of other ethnic minorities. Uh, these protests are usually small and usually outnumbered by counter-protesters, but still, these kinds of organizations hadn't really had much of a presence in Toronto since the 1990s, and so it was a, a bit of a shock for many to see them making a kind of comeback in, in recent years. Now, as promised, I'm going to close on a more positive note in a couple of minutes, but for now, let me wrap up what I've done so far. I've talked about what globalization is and whether it is something new or something that's been happening for centuries or for even longer. I've talked about globalization and homogenization, or the idea that the world is developing into one global consumer culture dominated by Western corporations. Uh, there was also deterritorialization and territoriality. Uh, you know, culture isn't as closely tied to place as it used to be, but place still matters. And there was globalization and cosmopolitanism, or the idea that faraway places are influencing each other like never before 
and this is making people more open-minded and better informed. But in reaction to that, we've also seen the rise of ethno-nationalism in recent years. So while the world is becoming more cosmopolitanism and many nation states have become very multicultural, there are serious organized efforts all over the world to force ethnic minorities out of nation states. And now here's the positive note that I, that I said I would end on. It's an example of how local communities can do things to overcome racism and ethno-nationalism within them. And uh, just to get this, this piece started, uh, a content warning, I'm going to have to describe a hate crime just briefly. Uh, the situation was in 2015, someone set fire to the only mosque in Peterborough, Ontario. So for those who don't know, Peterborough is a small town about a two-hour drive northeast of Toronto. Um, it had one mosque and someone set fire to it in 2015. To this date, there have been no arrests, but the police have treated it as a hate crime. Um, after the fire in 2015, local churches and synagogues invited people from the mosque to come have their services in, in their spaces. And meanwhile, there were fundraising campaigns to raise money to rebuild the mosque. People raised as much as $80,000 more than what was needed to rebuild the mosque. So when the mosque was reopened after about six weeks, uh, the extra money was donated to various local charities. So that's just one local example. But in all the other examples I gave, you can also find stories of communities defending their most vulnerable members and resisting the ugliest aspects of ethno-nationalism. And I think those are important stories to remember, to document, to think about from these cosmopolitan but also volatile and unpredictable times that we find ourselves in. So with that, I will wrap up this episode. Um, we're also about halfway through this series now which means I'll be taking a brief kind of midterm break, but I'll be back in early July with episode 12 on New Olympics.